And we are back live. Welcome to Cognitive Rampage Podcast. Hope you're taking care of you. Hope you are living your Cognitive Rampage. We're back. Yeah. Uh, every once in a while, you start the podcast and you get the chipmunk sound. I don't know why. It just happens. <laughs> but we're back now. Double check. There we go. We are wonderful. Back up and rolling, uh, as I was stating earlier, in the new studio set up here in the Cognitive Cave. If you saw the video on my personal page there, you'll see. Now, we got a cool little loungy area for those that come over that don't want to be on the podcast or are attending with the guest we have on the podcast. So we got a cool lounge area out well, right there, kind of like a green room so you can still kind of hang out with the podcast and not necessarily be on it. Got our cool brick wall setting over there. So when we do some stand-up stuff or the LMAO podcast that comes on here, we do that as well. A whole lot of stuff going on. So... Uh, I am relaxing midweek. I hope your week is coming through. Midday, midweek coffee, something like that. Mm. Promise not to sip it in front of the microphone, everybody. Uh, but I hope you're doing good out there. I have news I will deliver to you all. Um, I am back in the therapist chair uh, after you know some time off for a while. Uh, I am back. Full-time therapist now, so back in the mental health field fully. I've always kind of stayed in mental health uh, as I write about it, blog about it, podcast about it, talk to a lot of people about it, so I've kind of always been in it, really. Uh, but I'm, I am missed it. I miss being in the trenches, really trying to help people in need. So uh, it feels good uh, to be back uh, in the chair, uh, as I like to call it. So in the chair, trying to help people. Um, and, and more than likely, um, being back in the field full time like that as a therapist, this podcast is probably going to go kind of back to the original roots of when it started, right? It'll probably come back to a lot of mental health, uh, issues and, um, those out there treating mental health, uh, who knows where the podcast gone will go. It's been roughly five years now, uh, podcasting and just a, a whole lot of love to everybody that, that listens, uh, that watches, shares, um, th the lovely messages I get. Uh, I try to respond to everybody. Uh, thank you. I, I read every one of them. So if you send an email to cognitive rampage podcast at Gmail, uh, I get those or message on Facebook either way or however you do it. Just thank you on iTunes as well. Uh, huge shout out to all the listeners that have subscribed on iTunes over the years. Uh, we uh, come in and out of the top 10 in alternative health on iTunes, um, just above 250,000 subscribers, and thank you all so much. And to the wonderful guests that come on this podcast uh, that make the podcast what it is, sharing their experiences, their their life philosophies, what they've been through. Um, it's I'm not sure I've stuck with anything for five years <laughs> in my life. I have tried just about everything uh, I've ever wanted to try. Uh, and it sounds good, uh, but there are some ups and downs that come with doing that, uh, with, you know, trying everything you ever wanted to try. And I, I you know, I encourage anybody to do that, to, to try whatever it is you want to try uh, to get out there. And I, I know, you know, real life is in the way sometimes. And I'm not one of those, um, I don't know, if Facebook influencer people that tell you to quit your nine to five immediately and follow dreams or whatnot. Look, if you can take steps toward your dream, if you're working on it a little bit, uh, you got to keep the job, whatever it is to do, I applaud you for doing, even if it's just that, that's something and that's a good thing. Uh, don't take too serious a lot of the, the people you see that uh, are, well, making money off of telling you that you should quit your job. Um, so just my hats off to those that are pursuing the things they love but are still holding down their family, taking care of their, their, themselves and those around them as well. Uh, it, it's, it's not an easy journey out there. And I can tell you, um, you know, gratefulness is something that you may see a lot, social media people talk about it, but I think it's underestimated. I think uh, a grateful mindset is highly underestimated, uh, in, in at least in our society o over here in, in, in the uh, Western culture. You know, I, I do listen to the BBC News podcast uh, most mornings, and, and I do that, one, to try to keep up with what's going around the world. They seem to be about the only middle-of-the-line news outlet, really. Uh, sure, we all lean certain ways, right? And I'm sure somebody will listen to this. Go, oh, you don't understand. They're linked to some party. But m m my point is I listen to that because they cover global news, you know, things that are happening all over the world. 
Uh, and it puts things in perspective, and sh- I'm sure I want to know those things, but selfishly, uh, it reminds me to be grateful for where I do live and the life that I do have or opportunities I'm allowed to have uh, by being here, essentially. You know, and it's small things, you know, to be grateful about that you can find. And, and it can be difficult if your mindset currently uh, is, you know, ridden with anxiety, depression, whatnot, worry. It can be very difficult. I certainly understand and empathize with that uh, 100%. It's not easy at all, um, you know, especially if you don't believe it to be. But it, it can be very difficult. You, you know, you got to understand that the way or how you've been thinking over time literally rewires how your brain functions, right? So your brain is functioning a certain way, uh, creating thoughts or whatever, but you can battle against that. You can come back against that, you know, and try to small find small things that you can be grateful for every day or in, in the moment, right? Um, I, found my, I find myself now when I'm driving down the road, you know, just being grateful for actually being in Florida, um, despite the hurricanes. So hope you're ready for Dorian coming. Um, but just how green it is, right? It's just green. I don't care about the humidity, the heat, you know, uh, we got air conditioned, thank God. Um, what they did not before that, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But my point is you can find beauty in just about anything if you're willing to look for it. If your mindset is set to find the bad in most things, you can definitely find that too. Uh, I've often told people I've talked to that it's uh, the artist's job, in a sense, right, to point out uh, the beauty in darkness as opposed to just simply pointing out the darkness that which is because a lot of the most people can see the darkness and, and what is in front of them. It may not be that easy to find the beauty in something that's dark. And uh, I kind of encourage all artists, painters, poets, podcasters, whatever, um, to do that, to try to bring the light out in the things that are dark and do that in your own life. Um, No matter how difficult it can be, you know, you can focus on it. And I'm I'm here to tell you, uh, no matter how dark it may seem in, in your life, at this moment, at this time, you will come out of it. You will adapt. You will change. Uh, don't let go of the faith and, and, and a belief in yourself uh, that you can do that, right? And, you know, don't expect changes quickly, right? Uh, a lot of times w- w- we expect changes in, in, in our lives and things to change immediate, right? Um, but be patient. Be patient with yourself, uh, those around you too. But if you're trying to make that change, uh, keep looking forward, right? You don't have to look for this massive change right away. Uh, I, I have a meme out there uh, that I'm on where, you know, one simple, one millimeter of change in a direction can change your destination by miles. If you think about yourself on a boat, if you just turn that boat just a hair, left or right, over time, your destination is completely different by hundreds of miles, right? So try to think about that in life as you're making that change or anything you're trying to do different, uh, that you can make the change, small little changes over time, right? Um, that you can come out of that and use gratefulness the most you can, you know, find it. If you find yourself sinking in that negative thinking or uh, predicting futures, which we can't do in some negative uh, context, look around for a minute. Find the thing that's, that, that sticks out to you that's beautiful, that you can be grateful for, even if it's the smallest things, man. You know, if you can be grateful that you see out of both eyes, there's people that can't, right? That you can hear, that you can walk, that you have both arms, right? I mean, these are simplistic things, I know. Um, And a lot of times, you know, we can get caught up in what this society tells us we're supposed to have in order to be happy, right? And as you may look around you, you may have debt, you may have bills, uh, you may be overweight, you may, whatever the fuck it is, right? Those things may be around you, and and that's a time where we can come back to the most simple things that we have. You know, uh, that's why I tell you, I, I hear in that BBC podcast, and you hear about things that are going on in Syria um, and all, all across the globe, really, where there's so much chaos uh, and tragedy going on. Um, it, it really puts life in perspective, and sometimes we got to do that ourselves. You know, we have to put ourselves in place, give ourselves perspective. Uh, even if it seems trivial, right? Even if it seems like it's not a big thing or, or, or worth it or, yeah, I know, of course I can see, but. But think about it. I mean, you know what? You, you try this, right? Take 30 minutes. Take 10 minutes, whatever. 30 minutes, 10 minutes, and blindfold yourself and operate around the house. Do that. 
right? It's a it's a little stoic, um, little stoic exercise. Uh, I can't remember if it was Marcus Aurelius uh, who presented that out, but it's a stoic exercise to try. Um, blind yourself. Put an actual blindfold on. That's where you can peek out the bottom now, right? Literally blindfold yourself and operate. Just try to make it 30 minutes around your house or whatever it is you're doing and think about what you might have been going to do and now that you might not be able to go do it because of that blindfold. These are things that just see, man, wow, we can overlook some of the most simplistic things like that. Um, you know, tie your hands behind your back, right? Uh, just operate on one foot. Find ways to see, thank God that you have what you have, right? And when we can focus on those smaller things to be grateful for at a time, over time, we can begin to be grateful for other things we may miss, other details in our lives that we may overlook or things uh, we expect just to be there just because, right? So you can find small ways like that to be grateful. Uh, and, you know, check your story. Check how you tell your story to yourself, whether it's your daily story, uh, your life story, etc. You know, uh, I've often... Uh, done uh, in therapy or groups with people, uh, if I handed you a microphone right now and I said, tell me your story, what would that be like? W would you tell me a drama, right? Would this be some lifetime movie, right? Would, it s would the centerpiece of your story be this traumatic event that happened to you? Uh, your childhood, right? Would, it, would you begin your story with all the shitty things that have happened or are happening, right? It's how you tell that story, right? And the way we've told our story over the years, over the years, begins to compound the beliefs that then structure what we believe about our lives, our story, our moment, our present, right? And another activity or exercise to give you, um, grab a piece of paper, right? Or if you prefer typing, do that, or thumbing, right? If you prefer doing any of that. And in a paragraph... Write that story, right? In a paragraph, write that story. Um, but I want you to write the story to include your entire life, yes, in a paragraph. Your entire life in a paragraph. And write that story out. And I want you to look at that. You're talking five to ten sentences max, right, around there. And I know it's hard, right? How do I include my whole life in five paragraphs or in five sentences? You can't, right? The point of doing that is you're going to write what's most important. And you will begin to see how you define yourself in those five to ten sentences. And now I'm giving you the in here, right? So try not to let your bias sink in as you do this activity. But write that paragraph down and see what main points you point out. And if they're negative experiences that you've had, perhaps that is one of the experiences you're allowing to define who you are that may, may be affecting you in your present life right now, right? And... A second activity after you do that to, to complement that is to then write a following paragraph of your life in the present, right? Of your life in the present and do the same steps, right? Evaluate that present paragraph of your life in the present. See what you're pointing out in those five to ten paragraphs or five to ten sentences and say, hey, well, man, I, I really, I wasted two sentences about this thing that is happening to me presently. Uh, or even in your life as a whole paragraph, you know, I wasted two whole sentences out of the seven or so I'm allowed to talk about this one thing, this bad experience or something. And you can say, okay, this is a place to start. If I'm, if I'm giving up 35% of my life to this event that I had to include in my whole life summary or 35 or 45%, right? If you give up four sentences to your seven or so you're allowed in your present life, that's somewhere you can start to focus to say, hey, I'm giving a lot to this one thing that's happening to me. And then take those two paragraphs and compare them as you look at your present life and your past life and say, how much is the two or three sentences or however much you dedicate to that one bad experience, how much of that in my present am I allowing to define my entire life paragraph, right? And if you don't see yourself writing about your present sentence, right, in your present life paragraph, if you're not adding that to your whole life paragraph, you may see how much what you're experiencing in the present really doesn't have such an impact on your entire life, right? That's kind of the ins and outs of doing that activity. So as you write that entire life paragraph, right, you can see, hey, man, I, I didn't mention anything I'm going on in the present. That's how much it's, it's not going to affect your entire life. And if you do, 
well, that's a great place to start to begin on to work on something, right? Uh, I, I've you've probably heard the podcast I put out a couple days ago, uh, a rehash actually, a video I did about the AU and BU, right? The BU has been through all the shit that you've been through. The AU has been silver sped, never s- silver spoon fed, never experienced any adversity in, in 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 its life, right? A and B, and which one would you respect more, right? A or B? Hopefully, you respect B more because you would. They've been through shit and have still made it to where you are. Well, that's you, right? Remember, be you. That's the synopsis of it, right? So to be you, so we can take the darkness of things we've been through and learn lessons from those things, grow from those things, and learn a lot about ourselves. That gives us lessons to tell, right? If you got kids, man, the things you've been through, come on now. This is the experience that gives us the ability to teach those lessons, right? And, and if you have kids and you're going through something, you know, personally like that, this, I think a lot of parents forget that this is a... Um, it's a gift. It's an amazing opportunity to show your your children what they can do when life punches them in the face, right? Because I'm sorry, mommies, you're not going to be able to protect your kids forever, okay? Life is going to happen, and you can't control that, right? Uh, I know you may think so, but you can't. So as life starts to do that, they're watching you, right? Our, Our children get more of watching you than what you say. So if you're experiencing a darkness, a bad time, something tough, lost a job, whatever it is, if you're overweight, right, and and you get yourself back in shape, these are things, opportunities, teaching moments, they're called, right? These are teaching moments for our children to say, hey, when my kid hits, you know, some darkness in life like they're going to, they're going to remember what mommy did. They're going to remember what daddy did when that darkness hit, right? If you're picking up the, the alcohol, you're drinking like crazy, you know, you're, you're living the fuck it philosophy, right? The fuck it lifestyle because it's all gone to shit and you're just turning everything around you into shit, right? Self-sabotaging even more so. Well, don't get mad at your kid when they're 20-something and they start self-sabotaging because they learn from you. What did you do when, right? Now, what did you do when? What did daddy do? What did mommy do when? So when I'm going through that at 20, how do I react to that, right? Now, they hit things, I hit things. They drank when it got shitty, I drank, right? When it gets shitty. So keep in mind of that, right? And the family's only as strong as the weakest link, right? So if your partner, yourself, or your kid is going through it at that time, or your cousin, whatever, your mom, doesn't matter. If they're going through that, help them out too, because that family unit, that partnership is only going to be as strong as the current weakest link that's experiencing something. So when you can spread that strength around, right? You know, the Red Rover game, right? It, it, you're all holding hands. Somebody tries to come over and run through your hands. You probably won't be able to play that game nowadays. Someone would be offended. You ran into my arm too hard. Um, Mm. left note sorry left field but you know like that game when you when you're all holding hands you're you're pulling yourselves together when that weakest link is going through something a transition in life to a new job to to a dream chasing uh you know weight loss whatever when when that unit can hold hands that unit is going to be stronger even if the other one is only holding on by one hand right so uh just i'm giving you some things to keep in mind, some activities to try for your own life, for your own mental health, or what you may be experiencing presently. Or if you know somebody, right, that's experiencing those things, um, relay some of these messages to them. Let them know, right? And, and look, it, it sounds good, right? It, it sounds good. We can see it. I've been in that dark place, too. I've been in that anxious place, too. And, and you know, the advice that comes at you when you're in those moments, it seems to bounce off and just ricochet, and we don't hear it a lot of times. And sometimes you may be in that place, right? You're hearing me going, oh, shut up, Adam. You know, you're not me, right? You don't, you're not here. You're not experiencing what I am. I, I get it, man. And I got empathy for you for it. I, I truly do. Um, but sometimes you just got to try that one little thing. Get that one little, one little spark, right? Because in the darkest room, the brightest light still shines, right? So if you can find that thing to be grateful for, if you can find that smallest bit of light in the darkest room, the darker the room, the more light that shines from the smallest little outlet, right? You're trying to sleep and that one green light in your room is still on from something powered on or something. Keeps you awake, right? You're like, oh, God, I got to cover it up. So the darker it is, the smallest light needed is all you need, right? To be able to see some light in that uh, or in your life, right? So that's why I, I really emphasize the gratefulness, the small things, arms, legs, eyes, ears, right? These things that you do, um, these yes these are the smallest amounts of light so if you're feeling at your darkest right 
find a way to turn on a little bit of light, right? Look around and find people that you're grateful for, right? Call a friend, tell them you love them, right? Helping other people out is another good way too to, to help. And a lot of times that's the last thing you fucking feel like doing when you feel like shit. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'll help people once I get my shit straight. And, and I get it. I get it. Uh, it takes some energy. But even if you're helping a stranger, something small, anything you can do, to get a little light in that dark room that you're feeling, right? Whatever, whatever thought you can create, whatever behavior you can do, however you can take care of yourself health-wise, physical-wise, biology, right? Focus on your biology is a great place to start. When I'm, I know when you're depressed, anxious, etc., the last thing you feel like doing, right, is eating healthy possibly or going for a run or something like that. Well, walk, right? Go for a walk. Find something, you know, and if you can chisel a little bit at a time, right, so, you know, for me, I'm, I'm what they would call an integrative therapist, a dynamic therapist, right? All of this uh, jargon, right? And assen essentially what that means for me, my, my theoretical approach to helping people or even in life uh, that I hope, you know, maybe you can grasp and, and understand, right? And grab, not grasp, but like pull into your life, right? That you can really use. Um, that's what my book, The Cognitive Rampage, was about. Uh, I'll vent on that in a minute, but, you know, change comes cognitively, right? How we think, what we think, it comes biologically, right? How our gut is working, right? Our gut is the second brain that affects our brain functioning, the food we put in it, the activity we're doing. Uh, biology certain plays a role. Environment plays a massive role. Um, and environment can be many, many things, down from the air you breathe to the people that you're around, right? Your environment consists of a lot of things, people, places, things in general. Uh, but it can also be the music you listen to, right? The TV shows that you watch. What goes in your eyes and ears also is a, a part of that environment. Uh, then you have neurologically, right? What What's happening in the brain, right? If you have traumatic brain injury, right? This is a massive impact, right? How the brain is functioning uh, on that level. So all, all of these together really, you know, are, are parts of it, right? And five, um, I, I like to put out in the behavior, right? What we do, how we think, what we do, our biology, our neurology, and your environment. Those five things. If you can chisel away at a little bit of those each day, right? Sometimes focusing on one each day is a good thing to do. You can start with small little goals to start changing your biology a little bit. You know, do little small activities like that I talked about earlier, like I spoke about earlier, right? Uh, on, on judging how you think, what you think, what your environments. Take careful inventory of those environments, right? Um, look at your behaviors, right? See which behaviors are maladaptive or not serving you or rewarding you positively, right? Because negative behaviors can reward you too. We can, people get lost in those too. Negative behaviors certainly can reward you in some fashion. Um, but if you can chisel a little way at each one of those, this is how you be, begin to make that new structure of your life, right? If you just focus on your biology, sure, That'll help you. It's certainly going to help you. But to sustain change and to make change more quickly, right, because we want change to come quick if we want to do that, or even optimization, right? Your life may be fine. You want to optimize it. Um, it it's got to be on those five levels, right? Not just the biology, right? If you're just a workout machine and that's where you want to focus and that gets you going so you can work on the others, great. There's no method or, or, or order to work those in, okay? It's, it's work on those five uh, and you can bring real change, sustained change, and, and uh, above all else, don't give up belief that you will be better, that you're okay, right? That you can change, that you can make it, that you will adapt, that you will overcome. You shall find grateful ways to do it. My heart goes out to any and all of those that are in the middle of those things that are going through it. Um, please reach out to all the resources you have. You know, if you got questions that you'd like me to talk about or something you're experiencing too, uh, feel free to email me at cognitive rampage podcast at gmail. Tell me what you're going through. If you want me to leave your name out, etc., cetera, uh, do so. Uh, and I'll be happy to read what you're going through and then I'll do a podcast just to you. Right. Um, if I can, like I said, I'd leave you anonymous if, if you'd like me to do that. Uh, and I can do a podcast and answer or give you some some techniques, some some help, uh, some some places to start, right? Uh, if you're going through something like that, or if you go a friend that's going through something, right? That's okay too. Um, you know, I always look to help any way I can with the podcast. Now, moving on to athletes' depression, I've often uh, spoke about uh, athletes' depression and where 
where my toil lies with writing this book, right? Um, it's where it lies. I, I lie here. So we have so many, so many mental health diagnoses, right? There's, there's many. Uh, and I'm not going to go off about that stuff, right? The, the point is, is I don't know if we need any more mental health diagnosis. I don't know if we need to add more to a book that's already this thick, the DSM-5, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, it's, a, it's a rough walk for me, uh, ethically, philosophically, about that. Um, but then there's parts of me, right, where I understand the need for diagnosis, right? If we have a diagnosis, then we know how to treat it, right? We can do research, experiments. Um, we can try to help people in various ways on how to classify what they're experiencing. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of twofold, but, um, you know, when I would talk about athletes' depression, and I see it more and more every day. You know, you see Andrew Luck just retires, uh, you know, his body's beat up. Um, and I, more power to you, buddy. Uh, I'm Andrew Luck, I'm, I'm glad you retired. You're going to save your brain, your skull, uh, and probably live a little bit longer life. Uh, I saw a gentleman played fullback for the San Diego Chargers for a while, tweeted, I wish I could remember his name. Uh, he tweeted about uh, what he was experiencing uh, in life, what he was going through, uh, and count, basically screaming for help from from the NFL. Uh, Gronkowski just uh, came out today and talked about uh, why he had to walk away for a while, how he was getting him down and low. And you see this often, right? And you, you, you see athletes that reach the pinnacle, right? Um, Tyson Fury, the boxer, uh, is a great example of that. He had reached the pinnacle. Uh, of heavyweight champion, you know, he's the man and went off the rails, you know, almost literally drove his car off a bridge, you know, and was killing himself slowly with uh, overuse of drugs and alcohol and um, had contemplated suicide so much, you know, and then you see him come back and, and uh, to me, he won the boxing match. I, I think he beat Deontay Wilder. I know there's an argument out there, but I think he beat, I watched that whole fight. He won in rounds for sure, uh, in my opinion. But anyway, you know, you, you see athletes do that. John Jones at one point was at the top of the world, and he's he's turned his life back around up to now. Uh, a lot of a lot of hope and, and, and prayers for you out there, John. I hope you keep doing what you're doing. And you see them reach this pinnacle, uh, only to fall really hard, only to see people go down. Uh, and there are a lot of untold stories that we'll never hear about. Um, the high school athlete, the college athlete, in all sports. I don't care if it's, you know, basketball, tennis, gymnastics, uh, picket, track and field. Um, you know, it, it is, athlete's depression, in my opinion, is not biased to the sport you play. And there's many stories out there we'll never hear about, right? It, it's somebody that lives in your neighborhood's kid. Maybe it's you as an athlete, right? And, you know, you, you went through it that you don't have to reach the pinnacle for this to, to take you over and start to affect you. And, you know, it doesn't matter. High school, pros, college, wherever it ends, uh, it can certainly affect those. And there's many, many sad stories, you know, because as an athlete uh, at such a young age, right? So a, a difference, differentially diagnosed here for those um, sticklers out there for theoretical approaches, um, the difference is how the etiology of this diagnosis, right? What's the difference between depression, right, and this? As, you know, where major depressive disorder, depression a certain way, uh, sometimes can come on from environmental events, you know, situational events, things that are happening in our lives that begin to push us that way. Uh, some people would tell you how the brain functions, etc. cetera. Uh, I urge anyone to look up the real research uh, about the lack of serotonin and chemical imbalance, in quotes, as they call it. Uh, and try to find some evidence for me there. But anyway, athlete's depression, a, a huge difference is how it begins to develop based on the behavior and the environmental exposure at certain ages, right? So uh, in, I'm, a lot of some of this that I'm pointing out is m part of my hypothesis, right? The research is necessary, but part of this is part of my hypothesis that I, the, I believe the younger that you start playing sports, the more chance that you'll be affected uh, by athlete's depression and or a severe mental health disorder eventually in time. And I say that, and now mind you, I, I have to preface before I go here, there are tons and tons of positives to sports. So don't get me wrong, I don't want to come out as this person that's been the other obstacle in trying to find exactly how to write and put this book out. 
is I don't want to come out the anti-sport guy. I don't want to do that. I'm not saying that because there are amazing, wonderful lessons to be learned in playing sports. You know, dedication, taking care of yourself, working as a team, pushing yourself uh, beyond, you, you know, where your brain or limits tell you, I, I can't do it anymore, right? Quitting, dealing with loss, right? Overcoming, winning, right? There's there's so many lessons to be learned in sports and, and, and as athletes, right? So, uh, there's a, a huge issue with me there, right? I don't want to come out as this person that is, you know, anti-sports, all right? So I, I'm not that, right? I'm only pointing out w what I've seen in my research, what I'm noticing, clients I've spoke with, uh, et cetera. So there, prefaced, right? The disclaimer, asterisk that thing for you, all right? But in my hypothesis now, as, as I'm writing too, um, I believe the younger that we begin sports, yes, the better you're going to be when you get older, no doubt. But I also believe that the higher chance that you will be affected by athletes, depression and or severe being the key word there, severe mental health disorder in some fashion. Because when the brain is developing, right, uh, males' brains aren't done developing um, till I want to or like 22, something like that, around that range, give or take. Uh, neurologist messaged me, somebody look it up, Google it real quick. I know I'm close. Maybe it's 19. I don't know. In that range. Range, right uh, females brains I think are, lo are longer I think it's 25 for females 24 25 for the brain is fully developed right and if you look at the f the, the human brain as let's call it a plant right uh, if we have this plant that's growing that plan is very sensitive to the environment that's around it, right? Uh, Dr. Jack Cruz, uh, shout out to you. He's been on the podcast multiple times. Go back and listen. Great dude. Uh, insightful guy, man. Um, if we take a blue tarp and we put that over a plant, right, it's going to die. It's not going to make it, right? Various reasons. If we put the plant out of the sun, right, wherever we do, there's small things that can affect that plant. There's even research out there. I know everybody's heard about it where, um, excuse me, they had plants in a classroom and some plants they had the kids yell mean things at it and the other plants they said wonderful kind things to it and you could seriously see the difference between the two plants right so that's just a plant we're we're a similar organism to to the plant with a lot of other things and added to it um forgive the summary so the brain is is that influenced by its environment, right? What it experiences, what it sees, what it hears, what it goes through, etc. So when you take a, a child that has never played sports, right, has not been around that, uh, and they go through their life, you can imagine the things that influence it, right? Now, this is, imagine a controlled setting here, okay? I know we can't account for a perfect controlled setting, um, you know, but let's just say trauma, violence, certain things aside, right? And that child grows up, brain develops, etc. Right? They went to school, they came home. I know they're still exposed to other things. I'm not saying that athletes are more, but it's the difference of the exposure, just the difference of the environment, right? The child begins to define themselves at a young age by how they perform, right? Your performance thus deems your value. If you perform well, you have better value. You're all, you're a starter. Uh, you 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 I don't know. Get the all star team. Pick whatever those rewards come. And those rewards that come from being an athlete begin to define the athlete, right? Um, and being connected to a group. You're also told what to do most of your life, not just by your parents, but by coaches. They structure, tell you what to do. You you fit into a program, quotes as they call it, right? So imagine that over time, you know, a six-year-old, I started playing sports when I was six, um, played three different sports all the way up to about high school, right? Played baseball in high school as well. Football became my main uh, focus later on. Um, but as the brain develops over time in these environments, right? The environments of failure, right? Uh, let you be the person that uh, missed the tackle or struck out in the bottom of the ninth, right? And lost the game and go back to school the next uh, the next week, right? Uh, you're written about in the papers if you're performing well, right? Uh, if you perform poorly, right? And nowadays with social media, other people can take to the airwaves uh, and talk about you as well. So you take this and all the rewards, right? I mean, it, the, the developing child, and I mean teenagers too, they're children in my eyes. Uh, the brain's not developed yet, right? They are also, this is when they're learning groups, where, where they belong to, where their rewards are. The reward system is fully based and coming from the sports organization. Um, the, the team around them, the acceptance to the group, a.k.a. the team, uh, right? And so as this develops, 
the athlete uh, begins to define themselves as the athlete, right? Uh, I remember in high school, people didn't, you know, say, hi, hey, how you doing, man? What's up? Uh, yeah, I play sports. What do you do? I, yeah, I'm a linebacker, right? I define myself by this position. I'm a football player. Other would define you. Oh, you know, Adam, he's that football player, right? And you become, you get defined by this, right? It becomes who you are. So your value is defined by your performance, acceptance of the group, is also rewarding in certain ways, rejection from the group as well. And your performance versus value, you're defined by it. It becomes who you are, this title, um, and the development of it, right? And now, I'm not even adding in into this brain injury, okay? I'm not even talking about CTE right now, okay? Uh, I'm not even going there. I'm not really decided if I'm going to go there with the book either. Uh, I'm trying to kind of separate this because CTE brings a whole, whole gamut of complication. You know, traumatic brain injury is probably one of the most difficult things to treat uh, as we don't know how the brain fully functions, right? We're in our infancy and brain functioning, understanding it, right? Uh, we may know some basics, but what we know compared to what we do know, right, is what I'm talking about, um, is a massive difference there. You know, um, so I'm, I'm not even bringing in head injury here. Once you take in the variable of head injury, man, you have opened Pandora's box of unsure, right? So I'm just focusing on not on head injuries, right? Maybe some less uh, impactful sports like golf, tennis, right? That's why I'm including those sports because certainly someone could argue, um, you know, the, the impact or combat sports even, um, separate or, or go into a different uh, genre, right? Sure. So if we include all sports, we can hopefully try to rule some of that out as the research goes on, right? So now the, the child maybe ends sports at high school, right? Um, maybe they end in college. Maybe they end in semi-pro or pro, right? When that goes away, when it's no longer, there's a massive void of emptiness that begins to take over an athlete, right? Because they are no longer what they have defined themselves by. Now, uh, we did a small survey with uh, about a thousand people uh, up at DePaul University, uh, and we found that it really didn't matter how long you played, whether you left in, you know, in high school uh, or left four years into the pros of a sport. Um, the variable outcome was about the same of your chances of experiencing, you know, severe keyword, a mental health disturbance, right? And or athlete's depression is what I believe in a hypothesis uh, in various ways. So it really didn't deem how long. I think a, a big issue is how early you start. That's where I, I think we're going to find the biggest um, difference, right, and change. You started when you're 16, played for two years and stopped. I think that will be less of an impact than when you started when you're six, played until, you know, you're 18 and then stopped. I think that's where you'll see a, a big variability. Surprisingly, with that small survey, it didn't matter the effectiveness of, of, of experiencing a severe mental health disturbance of some level four years in a pros, high school, right? So that didn't matter. So <clears throat> take this athlete and they had played for so long. I don't, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter how long. And they, they are no longer there. So during the developmental years of the brain, of the personality, right? And think about the five, the, well, we'll stick with the, uh, the five, or the five things I talked about on how you make change, right? Biology, uh, cognitively, uh, environmentally, uh, neurologically, right? So think of um, behaviorally, or think about those things. So as we develop from six years old on as an athlete, how those five things are influenced to create the present person or brain functioning at that present time, 18, 19, whatever, 16, 22, uh, 34, whenever they stop playing that sport that has defined them, that has become, that is a major ingredient that has defined the individual. Since development, the brain has concreted this part into being a part of the personality. It's just not like, well, you'll have to find something else to do, right? You're trying to remove 15 years, 25 years of brain development, right? Of biology development, of cognitive development, of what has built, what has added to that, a major ingredient, right? Think about it like DNA, right? We used to think we made it when we had cracked the code, right? But then come to find out each little piece of DNA is linked to something else that we didn't know was linked. So think about how much of that is all linked after 15, 25 years, right, of playing sports and being in that environment defined by this simple title of I am an athlete, right? So when that is removed, how much of those five influencers begins to be affected? 
If you're an athlete, an ex-athlete, you know, I'm speaking from experience myself, you know how much that has an effect on you because we have defined ourselves by it. It is the story we have told, the reasons we did what we did, what we sacrificed what we did, dedicated what we did, right? So the difference, right, all this was a squirrel off, so looking at the difference between basic depression and then what that athlete is experiencing that's different, right? The kid that wasn't attached to uh, perhaps a, a sports program or a program of any kind uh, or maybe got into it later, right? They're, they may not be uh, as defined by this on all five influences, right? At least so concretely and so impactfully over the time, over time, when that athlete does. So when that is no longer, you're losing the environment, your friends, people, places, and things, all you knew, this begins to go away. The reasons you took care of your biology, the reasons you cared about what you ate, how you worked out and stayed in shape was for that sport to play that game. Well, that's no longer there. So the rewards from your performance are no longer there. It becomes difficult to find value in oneself. Why the non-athlete perhaps found value in other places. Um, grades, other friends, not defined by that social circle or that title, right? So all of it is affected and goes away. So the, the behavior rewards, the environmental rewards, the biological rewards, and now your belief schema, how you think and what you have thought about yourself, the story you have told your entire life has come to an end. What do we tell now, right? These are where these influences are, effect, are affected. And of course, your neur neurology is affected because all of those four along the way, the environment, your biology, um, and how you think and your behavior, those four things have all created your present neurology, how your brain is working, how it's wired, if you will, for simplistic terms, have created that. So when, those, when that goes away, when the sport leaves, how is your neurology affected? How is that neurology then affected when all of it has been based on that and it's all gone, right? That's why you see a lot of athletes or at least combat or uh, uh, impact sports uh, turn to uh, martial arts in some way when it's all over. Mm. And this leads me into the environmental aspect of it. The environmental aspect of this, it leads me into it uh, as the environments, okay? These are hypertensive environments, right? These are hypertensive environments. So, um, you know, when you're on a football field and people are crashing into each other 100 miles an hour, we're talking hypervigilance, right? We're talking military-style hypervigilance. Your life is in your hands when they say hut, right? You're focused on this. So um, in impact sports, martial arts, right, the same thing. When that, when that round clips and your time to go, it's war, right? It has dire consequences. So even in other games and sports, right, even in other sports, I don't care what that sport is, you become focused, you are intense, any athlete would know, right, game day or, um, you know, match day, soccer, whatever, that, that's intense, and when you're in the middle of it, you are wrapped up in it, and you don't get it anymore, right? So what happens is with many athletes, when it becomes over, we begin to seek out hypertensive or hypervigilant situations because our brain is wired that way. Our brain is wired to seek out those thrills. We won the game. Even we lost the game. These are mood changers, neurological stimulants, right? They hit us in certain ways, literally and figuratively. So what we do is because our brain has been adapted by those other four influencers over the time, over time that has created our present way of thinking, how our brain operates, we look for that hypervigilance, right? And I'll speak for myself. When my football career ended, man, I looked for criminal activities. That's what I did. Mainly I was hungry in a sense, but I was drawn to it, right? I, my, my boy Haystack, I was drawn like a moth to a flame. In, in one of his songs he sings, I love that part. I, I always think about that when he says it. I was drawn to the game like a moth to the flame. I was drawn to the hypervigilance. I was drawn, drawn to the excitement of it all, that I could get arrested or uh, I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, right? Th these became attractive to me because guess what? My brain was wired for it. I'd been training for it unknowingly for 20 years right? I've been, I've been ready for this environment, right? I've been ready to, to live the fast life. It felt normal there. It felt normal there because my brain could function there. My body could function there. To live in a state of hypervigilance, wondering if the police was going to get me or if somebody was going to rob me or if I was going to get caught or doing stupid shit. Doing that 
fed me what the football field fed me like nothing else could. The drugs also fed it along the way. I could reach that state of hypervigilance, right? And some of that plays into my life even now. It's why I get on the microphone on podcasts. Um, that's why I, I try comedy, right? I do comedy, I guess now, right? I do. That's why I get on stage and do comedy and stuff because you get that rush, right? And you're getting that rush. And so when that state is thus created and then removed, imagine 15 years of living in that hypervigilant state, what that does, take a soldier, okay, who's been in war for five years, 10 years, the PTSD effects from that are tragic, right? It's tragic. It affects so many veterans out there that are going through that. And they come back and they're trying to live that, quote, normal life, but the brain has been wired for survival and normalizes hypertensive, hypervigilant situations in order to survive, right? So coming back to normalcy doesn't fit right. It's the same with the athlete, right? Uh, it normalizes. It's why a lot of people that are from abused homes, right, that have been abused or are around some violent, uh, hypertensive or, or, or hypersensitive environments like that, um, they go on to be abusers themselves, sadly. They go on to repeat that behavior because living in that abusive home over time, the brain develops to adapt. The body, how we think, it, it, it grows and develops to adapt to that. And then what we do is we then create the very environment you left. So if you're from an abusive home, it's highly likely you may be abusive. You may turn your home into that, not knowingly, but it's because that's where your brain and body operates, right? That's why you see a lot of those athletes, they go off the rails. When it's over for them, they go off the rails or they make a stupid decision and come back and say, try to fight again, right? They're in their 40s and they're going to come back out of retirement and fight. Uh, it, this is ridiculous, right? They do that because they don't understand that their brain has been wired to operate on that level. Their biology, they're used to that environment. Everything feels calm there. That is the biggest difference between the basic idea of depression itself and athlete's depression. It's the etiology of it, the manifestation of the athlete's depression that's taking hold because of the developmental process and, and environments of the athlete throughout the years, throughout the time. This is a separation. That is where major separation takes place, okay? You could probably compare something similar to a, a, an abusive home, uh, except a lot of the rewards may not be coming like you get the rewards from sports. You get these rewards from sports when you do win, you do succeed, when you do start, you do something well. We get, I mean, our entire reward system and negative system, our punishment system, everything is wired through that development of an athlete, right? So these are where the major differences are in the treatment of that. That's why I think the athlete's depression diagnosis is necessary, and I am the very first one to ever mention the idea of athlete's depression. I spoke about this in 2013 to my mentor, Leo Dianabal. I wanted to focus on athletes. That was the chosen niche I wanted to do as I got as I became a full-time therapist. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, and may focus back there again. Um, and I've spoken about this forever because it's something I, I experienced. And as I learned about mental health diagnoses, I didn't see anything, any criteria that fit what I had experienced under. Depression was the closest, maybe adjustment disorder, but that seems so mild. So, and, and, and so the more research I put into it, looked over, okay, what's different between your typical childhood that doesn't play sports, intensive sports now, I'm not talking necessarily YMCA, things like that, intensive sports, intensive parents, um, you know, that are driving it home uh, uh, about that, a wonderful documentary that every, I think every parent, if you have a child, you need to, if you have a child that plays sports, you need to watch the documentary, um, as it's Trophy Kids. Chris Bell, who's been on this podcast before, he's been on it twice. Uh, Chris Bell put out that documentary with HBO Sports called Trophy Kids. Um, watch that. It, it will, it's, it'll heat you, but it may help, help you as a parent uh, if you're the parent of an athlete, okay? So I encourage them all to watch that. Um, so what do you do? right? What do you do? Treatment of that athlete is different. Okay. I'm going back to this because treatment of depression is typically one way uh, why treatment of something else is another way, right? So the standardized treatment of an athlete, if in my hypothesis, if basic, your, your, your basic depression treatment plan is applied to an athlete, I think you're going to fail. 
it usually starts out and there, there's the first, the misdiagnosis happens first. Usually the ADHD diagnosis happens first. That's usually the first thing. Um, then usually you'll come into a depression diagnosis. Uh, after depression diagnosis and time obviously has gone by, uh, unfortunately they get hit with a bipolar disorder diagnosis. Again, this is a very rare disorder. It's, it's so very rare. One of my mentors, Dr. Jan Burt, uh, one of the most renowned psychologists uh, down in Fort Lauderdale, Boca Raton area, uh, you know, he spoke about it to me for a while and mentioned how much it's overdiagnosed, that bipolar is one of the most rare diagnoses to truly find someone bipolar. Unfortunately, uh, there's tons of overdiagnosing that disorder and athletes will get pinned into that, you know, and there's various reasons why that begins to happen. Uh, a lot of it linked to how the athlete is trained over over their life, how to think it may appear to be ADHD when they get a little spark of, all right, I'm going to change my life, do this, and they, they, they run hard for a minute or well, they can't concentrate on certain things, right, because nothing's pulling at what's passionate, right? How do you replace that Saturday football game or Friday night lights, right? How do you replace those rewards with all that's left, right? It's trying to replace that, which becomes difficult. Um, so, you know, how you treat an athlete that's experiencing that is different, in my opinion, than how you treat somebody that has not been a lifelong athlete that has depression. And that's why I think the diagnosis is important, because if we can diagnose it as athletes depression, we can understand the development, the, the development of the disorder and know how better to treat that disorder itself. Um, the same way it got there. Right. Um, yeah. And part of that links to the cognitive rampage, right, on, on how I believe you would treat an athlete with some modifications. So if you're an athlete out there and you've gone through what I'm talking about or uh, you're experiencing something like that, please reach out for help uh, to anybody that you can grab on to. Uh, that's the other thing. Athletes are, are one of the last people to ask for help. Um, you know, they're going to do it themselves. They're going to get through it. Uh, they don't need anybody else. And that's where it can get really dangerous for athletes is because of that mindset. That is the athlete mindset. I'm going to work hard. I'll push through it. I'll make it out. I can take the pain years and years and years go by. They don't reach out for help or you don't reach out for help. You just keep faking it and it's not working out. And then you get a junior sale that happens. So very tragic. You get something like that that happens and that's where it's terribly sad. So please, if you're an athlete experience something like that or if you know an athlete is send them this let them know or something uh, but please reach out for help uh, you have to it's not weak to reach out for help okay uh, ask for help just like your team may have helped you when you were on the field or on the pitch whatever you were doing you needed your team to make that win to make that play and in life as an athlete it's the same thing reach out to a team create a team around you uh, don't go quietly into the night just thinking you'll tough it out, okay, as an athlete. Please reach out. You're not alone in what you're experiencing as an athlete. I, I promise you there are many, many athletes going through that same idea, wondering what, what's happening. This is why a lot of typical treatment for athletes does not help. Uh, sometimes can make it worse because they get diagnosed with the wrong disorder, the wrong medications take place. It throws, you know, a biology, what used to be a fine-tuned biology, and you begin to throw, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals at that biology and at that neurology, and you can, it, it's much more sensitive. As an athlete, your body and mind are, can be a lot more sensitive to little tweaks and changes, right, especially if you lived as a lifelong athlete. So small changes in, in pharmaceuticals or applications of those things are... are um, can be dangerous. They can also be helpful too, right? I want to play on both sides of that, right? Because that's certainly true. Uh, but please seek help if you're an athlete out there. I'm working on this book the best I can, as fast as I can. Again, I'm not a sports hater. Uh, for me, if this can begin to bring awareness to those issues, right? I, I do wonder and hypothesis that hypothesize that what if what if we could inform the athletes at a young age that this is something they may experience, right? What you're going, being prepared for that, right? If you can prepare an athlete over the years of what they may experience and, and also as a parent, not reinforce what's already happening, that your child is defined by their performance, that their child has value despite their performance. Uh, and I'll, I'll start that by saying if, if a child is just born, you're holding an infant in your hand, does that infant have value? Because it doesn't perform. The infant cries, shits itself, and you have to do everything for it. It doesn't perform anything. It just lays there. 
does that infant have value? Of course it does. That's my point, is we are not defined by our performance, that you hold value regardless of your performance in any level, okay? We make mistakes, we do bad things, shit happens, right? Uh, but we have value. And if you can help remind your child that's going through sports that they have value regardless of their performance on the field, um, that's a good way to start, that not to let them too much define themselves by the sport they play or the position they play, that they are not the sport, that they are separate from that, that that's something they do. I do wonder if we could bring awareness that early because in my house, it was football, period, and that's how I eat, sleep, breathe, live, think, dream, <laughs> entertain. That was it, right? So um, that's a good place to start if you're a parent, if you're an athlete too. Uh, if, if you're an athlete, being just being aware of what you're experiencing can help uh, with awareness comes change as my mentor Leo Dianabal has told me many times with that awareness can come change and to know what you're up against right if you watched film you, you know before you played ball right you, you watched who you were going to play so if you can watch film on yourself if you know that those five influencers are what is causing your the why your brain is functioning while you're doing what you're doing why your seat why you are seeking out risky behaviors, et cetera, self-destructive behaviors, et cetera. If we can be aware of that, then you know you can start to chisel away at that in some fashion, okay? Uh, that's sort of a synopsis summary uh, of my book. Uh, I was going to read from what I wrote down, but that's pretty much a, a synopsis of what I wanted to talk about um, and bring that to the forefront. So I'm working on that book, Athletes Depression, The Killing Fields is what it's, uh, the subtitle, Athletes Depression, The Killing Fields. I... I don't know if that'll be too hardcore. I don't know because, again, I don't want to be anti-sport. I am not anti-sport. Don't want to be that. Okay? It provides a lot of good things, too, but we have to be aware of what's happening, you all. So, um, yeah. Uh, love you all. I think I'm going to take some comments here, actually, some people that have uh, commented some things uh, and see if we can add to that. Um, but uh, I may cut the podcast here when we edit it. So, uh, hope you're taking care of you. Hope you're living your cognitive rampage. All right, now we can go to comments, right? See what we're talking about. Um, oh, here comes the old guy. Hold on, excuse me, guys. Voila. Now we can see. Um, let's see. Um, Andrew Moranti checking in, man. Oh, we'd love to have you back on the podcast, buddy. Uh, hope you're doing all right down there. All those little lovely daughters you got, man. Big family down there. Great guy, Andrew. Um, those experiences wake you up. All right, I wish I caught this earlier and I knew what experiences they were. Um, Eddie Aguilar checking in. Shout out to your brother. Uh, I definitely share the, <laughs> I share the shit sometimes with my kids so they can know how to go through their, yeah, you, yeah, I would agree. I agree with you. Um, careful, you know, don't want to, don't overshare with your kids, right? Some try to gauge age appropriate, right? You know, how you get over the shit you're going through, uh, I think adds a lot more to it. Oh, Haystack checking in. My boy Jason Winfrey. What's up, brother? Love to you, homie. Uh, quoted you just a little bit ago, man. Uh, my boy, JB Rent checking in. Man, what's up, Brent? Uh, all I find is brain development is estimated. Okay, age 25. There you go. Thanks for checking in uh, for me there, Brent. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining in, jumping on the podcast. Michael Brodsky, Juan Hernandez, uh, my brother from another mother. Love you. Uh, Erica Caroline checking in. Tanya Anderson. Uh, Crystal Martell, Anthony Sergi, what's up, buddy? Hope you're still winning the races out there. Angela, Angela Bailey, uh, Chris Jarrell, my boy out there, man. Um, Matt Michael Williams checking in. Robin Hoffman. Yeah, I was just on Robin Hoffman's show um, yesterday. I'm not sure when the actual episode comes out, but her show called Chat With Me. Uh, really cool 15-minute little chat Robin and I had. Check her out. Uh, my boy, Carrie, checking in. Man, what's up, Carrie, brother? Hope you're doing good out there. Stephanie Williams, Chris Hall, um... And Patricia Mayo. Love you. Love you all out there. Uh, hope you enjoyed this podcast. And, well, got to end it one more time. Hope we're taking care of you. Hope you're living your cognitive rampage. Love you.